Intel took a beating in 2017. Ryzen was embarrassing Team Blue with more cores, threads, and cache, unlocked multipliers across the board, and budget tier overclocking motherboards. Rather than proactively launching their own desktop 6 cores to at least look like they were taking AMD seriously, Intel stood their ground, sticking to the tried and true formula of the previous six generations, which, looking back, has left Kaby Lake as a largely forgettable refresh of Skylake. They did have one new product, however, a small concession to the enthusiast market, their first ever dual-core i3 with an unlocked multiplier, to which enthusiasts collectively said, thanks, I hate it. In 2023, dual cores are dead. We've made our peace with the fact, I think. Six years ago, though, the standard Intel i3 setup was still hanging on, if only by some hyperthreads. Intel had enjoyed some success with the cheap, overclockable Pentium G3258 a couple of years earlier, but by 2017, dual cores were of appeal only in general computing, and far from the enthusiasts who'd been the Pentium's key market. AMD went one further by ignoring dual cores altogether with the launch of Ryzen, though Team Red would later release their own unlocked i3 equivalents in 2018 and 2019. The 200GE, 220GE and 3000G obeyed the same rules as the G3258. They were branded Athlon, which, like Pentium, is a former Premier brand that's since been demoted to the lower leagues, and more importantly, they were cheap. The G3258 had been $72 on launch, and wasn't even the most expensive Pentium that year. The Athlon 200GE was just $55, though technically was multiplier locked at launch. The 3000G was officially unlocked, had a $50 MSRP, and you could have fun overclocking them without forking out on an expensive motherboard. With the i3-7350K, however, Intel seemed to have missed their own point. It was a dual core with an unlocked multiplier, like the Pentium before it, and yet it had an MSRP of $168 and needed a premium Z series board to take advantage of its best feature. Now, I know this was the year before the Athlons, and a KBI3 and a Haswell Pentium were not comparable, but the 7350K still didn't make all that much sense in a wider context. At the time, AMD had the unlocked quad-core Ryzen 5 1400 for just £20 more, and factoring in the cheaper B350 motherboard as opposed to the premium Z170 or Z270, you could actually get twice as many threads for less money and still have access to easy overclocking. Still, in 2017, games weren't as entrenched in DX12 as they are today, and there were still instances of games that could thrive on strong single-core performance alone. In 2023, things are tougher on old-style i3s, and I don't hold a lot of hope for this one, even overclocked. Still, to see if there's anything to be rescued from the train wreck, I've pushed this i3 as far as I can with the technology at hand. That would turn out to be 4.8 GHz at 1.4 volts using LLC Level 4, which was the highest stable OC I could achieve. And frankly, the experience was still not all that stable, but I'll talk more about that later. The RAM is 32GB of DDR4 clocked to 3000 CL15. Again, higher clocks, even just 3200, weren't stable enough. Starting with the contextual title for the year of the CPU's release, Assassin's Creed Origins was developed at a time when dual cores were still extremely common, so it's kind of wild how big of a difference the CPU can make here. The built-in benchmark clocks in at just under 50 FPS on average, with 1% lows of about 35. The 0.1% lows are a paltry 7 FPS, but that's all part of the fun with the later AC games, and I saw the same thing occur from time to time on the i7-8700K. Speaking of which, upgrading from the 7350K to the 6-core i7 release later that year would have seen your FPS potential climb from under 50 to almost 90, though such an upgrade would have been pretty expensive. Or would it? Keep an eye out on the channel in a few weeks' time as I have an experiment in mind. 
Moving on to some more modern titles, Valorant is a nice steady start for the i3, being a DX11 esports title that's less concerned with how many threads you have than later games. My past testing of CPUs in this title gives us some context. The 223 FPS average scored by the 7350K is only 10 frames behind the i7-7700, which has a lower clock speed but double the cache. Fortnite's performance mode is DX11 again, so while the i3 might be a long way off from what can be achieved from even a two generation old Ryzen 3, it's still pretty playable. Averages almost hit 160 FPS and 1% past 60. This is the kind of scenario where I can see the i3 still being of some use, though I'd probably stop short of actually recommending it. One last DX11 title, this time a brand new one. You don't have to be a sweaty pro gamer to want to get a smooth experience in CS2, and while in an ideal world you'd be running at 100 plus at a minimum, you might still have a good time at 100 on average. The overclock may be saving the day here, as the 1% lows are dangerously close to 60 FPS, and depending on which graphics card you're using, you may see some frame drops below 60 in heavier maps or when smokes are thrown. On the other hand, Call of Duty Warzone runs on DX12, and core count matters. This is 100% unplayable. No ifs or buts. Unlocked, the game stops for a breather roughly every 5 to 10 seconds or so. There was something approaching a 60fps experience in between massive lag spikes, but not for long enough to fool you into thinking you were able to actually play. I even tried a 30fps cap which might have been slightly less awful, or might just have been my imagination. In case you hadn't noticed, 2023 has churned out its fair share of CPU annihilating games, and Starfield is no exception. In my test run through the Mast District of New Atlantis, the 7350K can pass the 30fps average mark, but 1% lows drop to just 22. Granted, you probably need a fairly above average GPU to reach these FPS without resorting to resolution scaling, but if you don't mind a touch of softness, you could probably get there with something like an RX 580. <music> 2020's biggest disappointment is enjoying a long delayed redemption story right now, but it's no kinder on CPUs than it ever was. The i3 fails to hit a 60fps average in Cyberpunk, though not by much. The big drops occur in specific areas like this intersection, and that can see frame rates drop into the 30s. The RT test fails to hit even a 30 average, and 0.1% lows can't even reach the teens. Not that you are going to pair an i3-7350K with an RTX graphics card, but it's officially not worth it for ray tracing in Cyberpunk. It shouldn't be reasonable for The Last of Us to use as much CPU power rendering empty woodland as Cyberpunk does in Night City or Starfield does in New Atlantis, but here we are. The i3 scores a couple frames lower than it did in Cyberpunk at just 52 FPS, with lows once more in the 20s. Like Cyberpunk, this is, frankly, a little better than I'd expected. Alas, Jedi Survivor is another complete failure on the 7350K, which is a shame because the beginning of the test run was looking fairly promising, scoring an average of almost 50 FPS. Maybe with a frame cap at 30 it'll be almost smooth. The problem comes at the end of the run. Walking into the bar causes a crash at the same point in every test run, and as I couldn't kill the app I had to restart the whole PC. I tried dropping clocks, I tried upping voltages, I tried running everything at bone stock settings without any OC whatsoever, and it still reliably froze as soon as Cal was partway down the steps. This one had me curious. I'd seen the Pentium G3258 perform well in Flight Sim, but only once it had eradicated most of Manhattan's geometry. 
Well, the 7350K does perform remarkably well, actually passing the Ryzen 3100 by a smidge, though, <laughs> you guessed it, it only gets there by massacring the geometry. Finally, a win for the 7350K in Civ 6. Not in any of the other desktop CPUs I've tested in Season 2 so far, no. Its 7.68 second average turn time in the AI benchmark is faster than the 7th gen Ryzen 7 APU, the 13th gen i5 and the 13th gen i9 in the last three mini PCs I tested. So, score, I guess. In DaVinci Resolve, the i3 takes less than twice as long to render out my 5 minute 4K test clip as the i7-6700K, which isn't a bad result all things considered. However, in raw numbers, that is an achingly slow 49 minutes 45 seconds. The Blender Classroom scene is also less than twice as slow as the similar generation i7, this time completing the render in 26 minutes 47 seconds. As I write this, a quick browse on eBay shows that some people are trying to sell this CPU for £35 or more, and at that price, it's appallingly bad value. Sure, you can make an argument for one of these in a budget build for DX10 or DX11 games, but if you already have or are going to invest in a Z170 or 270 motherboard, even today there are plenty of better choices. If you just want a basic CPU for web browsing and video decoding, the non-K i3s and i5s cost far less. If you wanted an overclockable gaming CPU and aren't too concerned about the latest games, the i5-6600K is the same price or less, and the i7-6700K is only about £25 more. In reality though, you shouldn't be buying into this platform at all right now. Whether or not the 7350K made sense in 2017, in 2023 there are cheaper, better options for older games and cheaper, better options for new ones too, and I'll be looking at a few of them in the next couple of weeks. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.